Line. This has been uh, just a weekend in the Word, and this is our final presentation dealing with the power of the Word of God to transform people's lives. So I'd like to welcome all of you. I want to remind you of our free offer that we have. We have a Bible reading plan. It's the Amazing Facts annual Bible reading plan, and this is our free gift. We'll be happy to send this to anyone who calls and asks. If you'd like to receive our Bible reading plan, the number to call is 866-788-3966. And you can ask for offer number 872. You can also download a copy of the Bible reading plan. If you'd like to do that, you can text the word READ to the number 40544. You can get a digital copy of this. Now, the nice thing about this Bible reading plan, you can actually keep it in your Bible and you can mark off each day the various chapters that you need to read. So take advantage of this. We also have another book we'd like to tell you about. It is the uh, ultimate resource. It's a book about the Bible and just some great practical information found in the book. We'll send it to you for free. The number is 866-788-3966. Ask for offer number 104. Or if you like, you can download the book by texting the word Bible to the number 40544. Well, we have a theme song that we've been singing in this three-part series on the Bible, and it's appropriately, Give Me the Bible. I'd like to invite the song leaders to come forward. Friday evening we spoke about finding the Word. This morning it was feasting on the Word. Tonight it's following the Word. That's going to be the topic that we're going to be looking at. Let's start with prayer. Dear Father, once again we are so grateful that we're able to gather together and open up your Word and study about the power of the Word and what it is for us to follow the Word, to follow the teachings for Jesus is the Word. So Lord, we ask for your special blessing. Send your Spirit be with those who are joining us around the country, around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Doug will be sharing with us this evening. Thank you, Pastor Ross. And uh, evening. 
Blessed New Year. It's hard to believe. Praise God, we survived 2020 thus far. Most of us. It's been a, uh, a tough experience. And that's why we think it's so impor- important and appropriate to begin the new year uh, founded and grounded on the Word of God, especially for those of us that are Christians for years. We want to become so well acquainted with this book that um, it just becomes part of us. As Pastor Ross mentioned, we have talked a little bit about finding the Word of God. Um, I'm a Christian today because I quite literally found the Bible. And then I found what was in the Bible. And it totally transformed my life. And my whole life revolves around teaching the Bible and preaching the Bible and everything with this church and amazing facts. If there was no Bible, it would evaporate. It's the Word of God. It's a message of God. We talked about last night how all the world, everything you see and you breathe and you do came into existence because God said, and it's the Word of God that brings everything into existence. And Jesus, of course, all things that were made were made by him, and he is the Word incarnate. So if we're Christians, uh, salvation is having Christ in us. Um, We celebrated a a modified communion service not long ago. And Jesus said, my words must be in you, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood. You have no life. How do you do that practically? Well, the most practical way is as you feast upon the word, you take the bread of life in you and you are nourished by it. Now, you know, after we've uh, talked about reading the Bible, talked a little about the importance of memorizing Scripture. That's one way you hide His Word in your heart that you might not sin. It's the weapon against temptation. And we talked about a regular reading program, picking an appointed time, having a place, having an atmosphere, but making a covenant to read the Word of God on a regular basis. Now, in my life, I I actually do my Bible reading six days a week. Part of the reason for that is the manna fell from heaven. You read about the children of Israel. Six days a week, manna came down. It landed in the morning. And the morning is the best time for me for Bible study. Now, I don't know how you are. Everyone's wired a little different. Um, You know, as it gets later and later in the day, I go from eight cylinders to six to four to single cylinder. Karen's the other way around. She gets real excited and she starts studying. She takes on new projects right around bedtime, but then she just crashes all at once. And, but um, I'm the clearest in the morning. And you know, the Bible says a lot about early in the morning. And they would go out and they'd gather the manna. They waited too long. The heat melted it and it evaporated. And I find that if, if you hide the word of God in your heart early in the day, it helps you calibrate your spiritual compass for that day. It reminds you that God is the center of your life. And so I recommend that uh, we take time in the morning. You get your manna. Now, God will rain it down, but you and I need to collect it. And then um, after we've done all that, then we must follow the word. Uh, The word is not uh, only beautiful poetry. There are commands. There is guidance in the word of God. And I find that there's a lot of people that think going to church and owning a Bible and even reading the Bible is a substitute for following the Bible. Some go to Bible study and they talk about the Bible. And they can quote scripture, but they don't follow the Bible. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word. Man must live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You know, I'd like to take you to a story as sort of a launching point for what we need to talk about tonight. You find this in the Gospel of Mark. Now, this story is actually found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But we're going to go to Mark chapter 14. I'm sorry, Mark chapter 10, verse 17. And this is the story sometimes referred to as the story of the rich young ruler. One gospel said he was young. Another one says he was a ruler. And so you put that together. And then later we learn he was rich. So we call him the rich young ruler. After Jesus blesses the children, and uh, this man is watching this all unfold where Jesus tells the disciples, oh, let the little children come to me. 
For of such is the kingdom of heaven. Takes them up tenderly in his arms and he blesses them. And he sees the love. He sees the deity, the compassion of Jesus. And it moves him. And he realizes something is missing in his life. He grew up in the church. He was an upstanding citizen, a member of the church. Probably held some office. But he realized that there was something missing. He did not have that assurance of salvation. And as Jesus was going down the road, after this experience, he began to dust off and act like they were going to take off. One came running, and he knelt before him, and he said, Good teacher, what shall I do that I might have eternal life? Now he's asking the right question. And uh, this is one of the most important questions anybody could ask. I heard about a salesman that was walking through a southern country town and he saw a boy sitting on a porch next to a dog. And he walked through the gate up to the porch and he said to the boy, is your mother home? He said, yes, sir. He said, does your dog bite? He said, no, sir. He reached out to pet the dog. The dog nearly bit his finger off. He said, I thought you said your dog didn't bite. He said, well, this ain't my home and that ain't my dog. So he was asking the wrong person the wrong question. <laughs> But this man is asking the right person, if you're going to ask about eternal life, who could you ask better than Jesus? And he's asking the right question. What must I do? Don't you all want to know the answer to that question? Jesus said, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. You know the commandments. That was Christ denying his godness. He said, no one is good but one, and that is God. No. Jesus, I think, was emphasizing he wasn't denying his goodness. He was emphasizing his godness. He's wondering, do you really know who you're asking that question of? And he points him back. When, when G, he says to Jesus, what must I do that I have everlasting life? Where does he point him? To the word of God. He says, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he's quoting from the second table of the law. And it may be the young man even in interrupted Jesus and said, well, Master, of course, what Jew doesn't know the Ten Commandments? Many Jews could quote the entire book of Deuteronomy from memory. So when you begin to, you know, quote the Ten Commandments, every Jew knew that. And I hope every one of you could quote the Ten Commandments. He answered and said, Lord, all these things I've kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him. You know, one of the keys to following the word is knowing that the word loves you. Sometimes we think about the word, you think about the book. It's inanimate. But this is a living word. The love of God is expressed here. It's a reflection of Christ, and he loves you. It says, looking at him, he loved him. He saw such great potential. He saw that his desire was right. And he said, one thing you lack you know, Jesus sometimes told someone, you're not far from the kingdom. One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have, give it to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven. I'm asking you to give something up, but I'm offering you more than you give. Everybody that takes up their cross to follow Christ makes a sacrifice. It costs something. But being a Christian pays more than it costs. He said, go, sell what you have, Give it to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven. And come take up your cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word. And he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. If you left church today with great possessions, would you leave sorrowful? <laughs> so many people think, if I could only have great possessions. A few years ago, someone did a survey and they asked uh, a sampling group of Americans, um, what would you be willing to sacrifice for $10 million? And it was amazing how many people said, I'd give up my family. Some said that they would uh, sell their children. Some said that they would, you know, sacrifice all kinds of moral absolutes for $10 million. What profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? And when he heard that, he went away. He's still rich, but he's sad. You know, that always struck me when Jesus said to him, take up your cross and follow me. 
Jesus didn't tell everybody, follow me. Jesus went to Peter, James, and John. He said, follow me. They forsook their nets and they followed him. He said to Matthew, follow me. He walked away from his cash register and he followed him. He, they followed the word. They didn't just hear the word, they followed the word. And of course, John and the James, same thing. Walked away from Zebedee, their father. Followed Jesus. You know, Christ may not necessarily be asking you to liquidate all of your earthly assets. Well, the day is going to come when I hope we all be willing to do that because you realize if Jesus comes and you have all your money in the bank, you'll regret that. Do you all know that? So the day will come, and I hope you're all praying about being open to God's leading about what to do with whatever resources you have, assuming you have any. But I don't think that's specifically what he's saying. But he is saying he wants everybody to put everything on the altar and say, Lord, I'm willing to give all to follow you. We were talking earlier about that man that found treasure in his field. He sells everything to get the treasure. Or the man who finds a pearl of great price, he sells everything to get that pearl. What in the world is worth more than everlasting life? So how do we reach everlasting life? You find the directions in the word, but you then must follow the word. You know, I remember hearing from history, I like reading about the great reformers and the Reformation, a gentleman by the name of Peter Waldo. Now, Peter Waldo was a very wealthy merchant that lived in Lyon, France, about 1170. And uh, he heard a sermon about the rich young ruler. And he was a wealthy, successful merchant, and it deeply convicted him. And he wondered if the Lord was calling him to do that very thing that Jesus said to the rich young ruler. And then a few days later, he had a near friend. He's, he's a young man. Peter Walder was a young man at the time, probably in his early 20s. He had a dear friend who choked to death during a meal and died. He choked on some food and he died in his 20s. And he was deeply struck by that and he thought about the brevity of life. And he made a decision. He put some money in a trust for his wife and the education of his children. I'm not telling you whether he did the right thing or wrong thing. I'm just telling you what he did. He sold everything else he had and gave it to the poor. And then he began to travel on foot and preach the word of God. And he lived a godly life. And he ended up raising up a, a whole group of preachers. And they were called the, the poor of Lyon. And uh, they would basically live uh, lives of poverty, but they traveled all through France and, and Europe and the Alps, preaching and teaching and distributing scripture. And he spoke out against the abuses of the church. Now he did this at a time when the popes were living in palatial grandeur. And so they were very convicted by Peter Waldo. But um, he took the word of God and he said, this is what Jesus says. And he took it all literally and he followed it. Now this young man that came to Christ, look at all the notable things he's doing right. He's eager. He runs to Jesus. He's humble. He kneels before Jesus. He had courage. He spoke up. He had spirituality. He's interested in, in heavenly things. He was morally clean. He says, all this I've kept from my youth. He was intelligent. He was young. He had promise of the future. A person of influence. He was rich. But he went away sad because with all of those benefits, what profit is it if you don't follow the word? He decided not to follow Jesus. Maybe what he did is he said, not now, maybe another day. But the truth is, you'd never hear from him again. Christ was inviting him to be an apostle. We don't know his name. But he basically said the same thing to him that he said to the other apostles. Follow me. And he said, not now or no. And he went away sad. What good is it if you gain everything and you lose your soul? Now, you know, before I forget, since it just came to me, I want you to jump to the end of that same chapter. What a contrast. If you go to Mark chapter 10, and if you look in the last verses, verse 46, same chapter. Now when they come to Jericho, as he went out of Jericho with his disciples in a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the roadside begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he can't see, he began to cry out, 
Jesus, son of David, had mercy on me. He'd been listening to the reports of Christ and he had heard about his miracles. He heard about his powers, compassion. And he thought this might be my only chance to be healed. Have mercy on me. And many warned him in the procession he was making a spectacle. Many warned him to be quiet. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. He said, come. And then they told the blind man, be of good cheer, rise, he's calling you. And throwing aside his garment, what kind of garment do you think a blind man wears? Now some of us, we've got good vision, but our clothes aren't uh, always ironed and clean as they could be. Uh, what do you think they look like if you're blind and a beggar? He's wearing rags. He throws aside his rags. What do we do when we come to Jesus? All of our righteousness is filthy rags. Just as I am without one plea. He realizes he has nothing to offer. And he realizes he's not giving up anything by throwing aside his rags when he comes to Christ. There's a great statement in the book Steps to Christ. What do we give up when we give up all for Christ? What do you really give up? Can you name anything that would be worth more than Jesus, his love, and eternal life? A heart polluted by sin? What earthly treasure, what habit is worth more than Jesus? It's all filthy rags. And he throws it all aside and he comes to Christ. And then Jesus says to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said, you think that's obvious, but you know, even though, did Jesus know what he wanted? Yeah, Christ knows all things, but do we still pray? Yeah, even though, you know, God knows what you have need of more than you do, but he still wants us to ask. There's so much that we don't ever receive because we don't ask. He says, what do you want? You must articulate it. He says, Rabboni, that I might receive my sight. Jesus said, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight. Jesus said, go, you're free. You got what you want. But what does he do? He receives his sight. He is so full of love. He follows Christ in the road rejoicing. So you've got this rich man who says no. He goes away with his riches and he's sad. You've got this poor man. He says yes. He throws everything away. He comes to Christ and he's rejoicing because he's got his vision. Amen. He knows where he's going. What a contrast. One says no to following Christ. One says yes to following Christ. One is sad. One is happy. Which one do you want to be? One follows the word. One does not. To be a Christian, it's not only reading the Bible, but we want to live by the word. We need to be willing to do his will. First John 2, now I'm going to give you a lot of scripture. There's a lot of scripture on this and center message of my message is the message, the word. First John 2, 17, the world is passing away and the lust of it but he who does the will of God abides forever. The most basic expression of God's will is found in his word. He that does it. It's one thing to hear it. It's something else to do it. He wants us to be followers of the word. Matthew 7, 21 and 22. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. You know, the commandments of God are also a great expression of God's will. Yea, I love to do thy will. Thy law is within my heart. Psalm 119, verse 44 and 45. Thy law is in my heart. Luke eleven twenty seven. It happened as he spoke these things, a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast that nursed you. And Jesus said, More than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. So Jesus is emphasizing it's not just saying, Lord, Lord. It's not being a member of the synagogue or the church. Doesn't the Lord say in the judgment there'll be many bewildered people that will come to him and say, we don't understand. Dan, we're out here with the goats. Lord, Lord, we taught in your streets. We know your name. We did many wonderful works. He'll say, depart from me. I don't know you, you who work iniquity. They didn't walk in the word. They didn't follow him. They went through all of the, um, the trappings of religion, but they weren't walking in the light. Matthew 5, 18, Jesus said, these people draw near to me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips, 
but their heart is far from me. So what's the key? What does the Lord really want? He wants our heart. If he has our heart, we'll be willing to follow him wherever he goes. I remember C.D. Brooks used to tell a story about these uh, two brothers. They, they were out playing in the park one afternoon, and they got tired of running around. They laid down on the grass and put their hands behind their head, and they were resting. And one of them got the bright idea. He told his brother, he looked up at the noonday sun. He said, boy, it hurts to stare into the sun. And his brother said, I bet I can stare into the sun longer than you. He said, well, I bet you can't. So they closed their eyes. He said, one, two, three, go. And they opened their eyes, and they stared directly into the middle of the undiminished noonday sun. You're not supposed to do that. And they were squinting, and soon their eyes were tearing, and they're trying to look at the sun, and they said, oh, I can't do it anymore. By the time they got home, they didn't realize how the ultraviolet rays were doing damage to their eyes. Their eyes were both red and swollen, and the parents said, what happened? They told them what they did and took them to the eye doctor. He said, oh, this is not good. He put some ointment on their eyes and wrapped them both up and said they can't open their eyes for three days. That was one of the hardest things for them, to be basically in darkness for three days. And after three days, they came back to the doctor's office, and he unwrapped the bandages, and the pain and swelling had subsided. They opened their eyes, and they could still see by a miracle of God's grace. The doctor told them, boys, don't ever forget this. The light is not for looking at. It is for walking in. You'd be amazed how many people claim the name of Christ, and they just look at the light. They don't walk in the light, or they don't fully walk in the light. God does not give us the light to look at. He gives us the light to walk in. Some of us walk in the light partially. We learn certain elements of truth, and we make certain changes, but then we see something we don't like, and we don't continue to move forward. And you know what? Your light that God shines into your heart will continue to grow brighter and brighter, Peter says. It'll get brighter and brighter as you walk in the light. He gives you more light. Some people have hit a wall in their Christian walk because God revealed something to them. It may have been years ago, and you never took the next step. And you wonder why you're not growing. Because you stop walking in the light. You can't just be hearing the word. He wants us to follow the word. Amen? Furthermore, Mark 3, verse, 20, uh, Mark 3, verse 32 and 35 there was a multitude sitting around Jesus, and they said, look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. I think Pastor Ross referred to this verse earlier. But he answered and said, who is my mother, my brothers? He looked around in a circle at those who sat about him, the disciples. He said, here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my father, he is my brother and my sister and my mother. Do you want to be adopted and part of the family of God? It's not just those that say, Lord, Lord. It's the one who do the will of the Father. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, Christ repeats a parable. He says, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I'll liken him unto a wise man who builds his house on a rock. And the rain descends, and the flood came, and the wind blew and beat on the house. It does not fall because it was founded on the rock. But whoever hears these sayings of mine, the word, and does not do them, he's like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. And the rain descends, and the flood comes, and the wind blows and beats on that house, and it does not fall. Now you notice they, there's houses in both stories, there's men in both stories, there's storms in both stories. The only difference between these two stories is one hears and does, one hears and does not do. Now when you preach a message like this, invariably someone listening or watching is going to say, Pastor Doug, you're preaching a legalistic message. It's all about doing. Friends, I've been quoting scripture to you. We are saved by faith through grace. But if you're saying, Lord, Lord, and you're not walking in the word, then you don't love him enough. You know, if we love him, what does he say we'll do? We'll obey him. Or we don't have enough faith. We're frightened to take those steps of obedience and walking in the word. Now, this is, I think, such an important message for the time in which we're living because there is a day coming, not too far away, when you're going to have to make a decision, am I willing to lose my life for the word? 
God's word says do this or don't do this, and I'm gonna go by the word of God instead of what those around me are saying. You know why we make a hero out of somebody like uh, Daniel? Because he said, I would rather go to the lion's den than disobey the word of God. The reason you've got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I guess I should use their Hebrew names, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The reason their story is in the Bible is they said, I know that it's gonna cost us our jobs and our life, but the word of God says, do not bow to images. We are not gonna bow. We are committed to following the word. And God stood up for them. He honored their faithfulness. But they said, even if God does not deliver us, we are gonna follow his word. You know, we're gonna need that kind of faith. And if we don't have faith in God to follow his word in the little things, how are we gonna have faith to follow the word of God in the big tests that may come? So this is, I think, a very valid invitation and challenge for all believers, both here at our local church and those who are watching, and I wanna greet our friends watching on 3ABN and AFTV, that we can be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving our own selves. Romans 2.13. So many people turn to the writings of Paul to try to imply God doesn't really expect us to be obedient. Uh, all of the statements that Paul makes about faith, they miss some of the other things Paul says. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. And read this one, Romans 2.13. Not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. That's about as plain as it can be. Now, will God ever ask us to do something without giving us power to do it? Now, don't, don't get me wrong, friends. Every day following Jesus is, a, is a, a, a battle and a blessing. Of course, it's tough being lost. You know that? It's tough being saved. Life has problems. So you just gotta make up your mind, you know, do I want problems from the devil for following Jesus or do I want problems from Jesus for following the devil? You just gotta decide who your Lord is. So if you're looking for me to tell you that there's some opportunity in life where there's no challenges, there is none. Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. There's trouble in life. I'm just telling you that if you want to follow Jesus, you need to be committed to say, I'm willing to go through the struggle and the endurance and the wrestling and the fighting and the striving. There are battles in following the word. That's the whole Bible history is about. Look at the struggles Israel had in trusting the Lord. Every human heart reflects the same thing. But a lot of churches today are diluting the gospel. And they're, they're talking about the grace and the salvation, but they're not talking about the following, being doers of the word. John 6, verse 67 through 69, you know, after Christ said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And then you know John 666, you know what that says? It's easy to remember, right? John 666. After these things, many cease to follow him. That's interesting. After he said these things, many stopped following him. Christ turned to the disciples. He said, will you leave me also? Listen to what Peter said. Jesus said, will you also want to go away? Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Where else are you going to go? Who are you going to follow? It's only Jesus that has that word. Let me share a few quotes with you that let you know this is not just the teaching of Pastor Doug, but some of the great Christians through history. D.L. Moody, never think that Jesus commanded a trifle or dare to trifle with anything he has commanded. Oswald Chambers said, obedience to God will mean that sometime or other you're gonna enter into desolation. There'll be challenges. He also said, it's not what we do that matters, but what a sovereign God chooses to do through us. God doesn't want our success, he wants us. He doesn't demand our achievements, he demands our obedience. It's only by obedience we understand the teachings of God. You remember Saul said uh, to Samuel, oh look, I've captured the cattle of the Amalekites to sacrifice to the Lord. What a big sacrifice we're gonna have. And Samuel said, uh, you didn't obey. To obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken in the fat of rams, for rebellion is as witchcraft. It, God wants us to be doers of the word. The smallest act of obedience is greater than any other external form of worship. I like what Vance Havner said, he's that famous Baptist preacher. 
He said, vision must be followed by venture. It's not enough to stare up the steps. We must step up the stairs. <laughs> a lot of people are always staring up the steps. At some point, if you're a Christian, you've got to step up the stairs. At times, I've deceived myself into thinking that talking about the will of God is a substitute for doing it. A lot of people will go to studies and argue it, but they don't actually step out in faith. That's why James said, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Why would he say that unless it was a problem back then? A lot of people are hearers, but they don't do. Now, as I'm sharing this message, you know it's not going to do you any good unless the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and you can put your finger on something in your life where you say, you know, I've been hearing it, but I've not been doing it. If you really want to see growth and progress, walk in the light, and he'll give you more light. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. He observes himself and goes away. And he immediately forgets what kind of man he was. I, I know, I hear about people who, you know, they become Christians and they make a lot of changes and they follow Jesus and they join the church. They may even hold position or office in the church. But they got that sin in their life that bothers them. And they don't do anything about it. They look in the mirror, they see it, but they don't allow Christ to wash it away and they keep coming back and they keep coming back. And pretty soon they get to the place 20 years later, they still have it, but it doesn't bother them anymore. You know, we can get a callus on our soul. And then every now and then the Lord will send a wave of conviction and God will say, how about now? Are you ready to go all the way now? But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, that's being a doer of it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Don't you want to be blessed? He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. And he who loves me will be loved of my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Now, I don't know if you caught that verse but there is a relationship that you will have with Jesus when you make up your mind to follow the word as he reveals it that is beyond any other relationship. If you really want Christ to manifest himself to you, did you catch that part? He said, I will manifest myself to him. Who has that experience? He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. The ones who say, all right, Lord, I don't know how this is going to happen. I don't know how I'm going to survive or succeed, but I'm going to step out in faith, and I'm going to follow you. I'm going to make a complete surrender. You know, that rich young ruler, he walked away from Jesus, but what did Jesus say to him? Take up your cross and follow me. You know, that's probably the most important verse if anyone desires to come after me, Luke 9, 23, let him deny himself and take up his cross. How often? Daily. Paul said, I die daily. I, Paul had that struggle. Every Christian daily has to say no to self. All selfishness is sin and all sin is selfishness. Love is the opposite. To say no to self and yes to love. Say no to the devil, yes to Jesus. And that's what it means to take up your cross. You're dying to selfishness. God isn't literally asking you to go be physically crucified. In some ways, it's often harder for us to say no to ourselves. You know, in, in being a parent, so often you've got to deny yourself because of love for the children. In being married, sometimes you've got to deny your rights and what you want to give preference and love to your spouse. And being a good neighbor, you might need to deny yourself but this is what it means to be a Christian. And when you do that, he that seeks to save his life will lose his life, but he that loses his life for my sake in the Gospels, he will find it. That's when you find the greatest joy. That's, he's, he said, that's when you find real life, is when you make those decisions. Yeah, we cannot follow, right now everybody's working from home, some think I can follow Jesus from home. No, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. You cannot follow Jesus online. It's a day-by-day day stepping out in faith. The vision must be followed by the venture. Obedience is the key that unlocks the door to every profound spiritual experience. 
I left out the author of that, but I think that was also Oswald Chambers. Samuel Dickey Gordon wrote, Obedience is the eye of the spirit. Failure to obey dims and dulls the spiritual understanding. That's what I was sharing before. As you walk in the light that he's revealed, more light, more blessing shines on your path. And Bible study helps you know about God, but obedience will lead you to experience God. You know, I, um, I remember hearing a story about uh, a scientist that did an experiment. Have you ever seen processionary caterpillars? Processionary caterpillars are some variety of moth or caterpillar, and uh, that, then when they all hatch out, uh, one of them they, they leaves out a scent as it walks, a little piece of silk if it's got a scent in it, and another one will find it and it figures its neighbor knows where the food is, and they instinctively are trying to find food, but their instinct to follow the silk of another caterpillar is stronger than their sense of smell to find the food itself. You got me so far? So you often see them going in a choo-choo train. They're just following each other. Yeah, any of you ever seen this before? I don't know, if, they may not have them in California. They got them back east. And you got this line of caterpillars all following the silk trail of the one in front of them. So what this, what this scientist did is he had a flower pot. In the middle of the flower pot, he had the favorite food of the caterpillars. And he put two or three of the caterpillars on the rim of this clay flower pot. And then after they walked around the rim, one time he added other caterpillars and pretty soon he had a whole train of them that were walking around the rim and they were all following each other and he wondered how long will they do this? The food was inches away but they followed for eight days until they starved and fell off. Just kind of pre-programmed. How many people in the world out here are following just the world? They're just following everyone around. They're following the culture. They're following the trends. They're following the news, heaven forbid. And, you know, the, the satisfaction, the food, it's within reach. And they're starving. Not completely related, but somewhat related. I heard about a woman that um, she called the police department in Michigan. True story. She said, I've got a skunk in my basement. And the police said, look, we, you know, we can't come out for every call like that. He said, what we recommend you do is you get a bag of bread and put a little trail of bread leading from the basement outdoors and leave your door open. Soon she called back the police station. She said, I have two skunks in my basement. <laughs> Followed the wrong way. You notice that when uh, they were called to follow there was no hesitation. If the devil can get you to ponder too long, he can talk you out of it. When Christ calls you, whenever he called anybody, did he say when it's convenient or when you get around it, around to it, just about everybody that uh, began to waffle failed. When he called Peter, Andrew, James, John, Matthew, and the others, they dropped what they were doing and they followed him. And that's the way it ought to be because following Jesus is a matter of life and death. When Bartimaeus knew that Christ was passing by, he stopped everything he was doing and he came right to Jesus. There's no such thing as distance learning when it comes to following Jesus. And some want to follow him, but they don't want to get too close. Now, there's, there's sort of a sweet spot when it comes to following Christ. Um, you know, I, I suppose, I don't think it's, uh, I don't know if it's illegal or illegal, but you all know what it means to draft behind a truck. Drafting, if bicycle racers, they get they, where they draft behind another biker and they find that if they can get behind the guy who's created a vortex in the air, he kind of breaks the air for them and he follows in that and there's less resistance. This is one reason that geese fly in a V formation. They take advantage of the drafting of the lead goose or the one ahead of them. And I know years ago, I used to drive my little car and I found my father's one who first showed me this. He says, if you got, um, you know, 15, 20 feet behind a truck, if it's going 60 miles an hour, you got caught in this backdraft, I could let my accelerator off and stay there and save a ton of gas. It actually creates a little more drag for the trucker, so I don't think they like that very much. And you have to watch out. If they drive over rocks, they'll break your windshield. Ask me how I know. 
But if you get too far behind the truck, you lose the drafting effect and you're on your own. There's that sweet spot. Now, you don't want to get in front when you're following someone. Following means you stay behind where you're following, right? I heard one time that Gandhi was leading a procession during a protest that thousands of people that he was leading uh, to the sea to go through some ritual with the salt, and he stopped to talk to a reporter. And after he talked to the reporter and the procession went by, he said, you have to excuse me, I'm their leader. <laughs> I need to get out front. And so you don't want to act like you're Christ's consultant and you're out front. You want to follow him, but you don't want to follow too far back. You remember at the crucifixion of Christ, at the betrayal of Christ, that um, it says, John followed Jesus into the judgment hall. At first, they all forsook him and fled. But John later, he regretted and he wanted to follow Jesus, and he followed him into the judgment hall. There was another young man, it doesn't name him, but we think it was Mark, and it says, he followed Jesus, and he had a bed sheet wrapped around him, and when the guards saw him following, I guess he got a little too close, they grabbed him, and he shook himself free, and they had the bed sheet, and he left naked, which tells us if you know, stop following Jesus, you may flee naked too. But then the Bible says something that's very sad. It says, Peter followed him from a distance. Peter followed him from a distance. He wanted to stay far enough away where he would not look like he was associated with Jesus. And when John went into the judgment hall, not at all trying to hide that he was a follower of Christ, Peter stayed outside and hung out with the enemies of Christ. He tried to mix and mingle and look like one of the crowd. And when they were all hunkered around the fire and they're mocking Jesus who's just within sight inside the judgment hall, Peter stood out there with him. And one of the girls recognized him. She said, aren't you one of his followers? Overcome with fear, afraid of the ridicule of the crowd, he was more worried about what the crowd thought of him than what Jesus thought of him. He said, no, I'm, I'm, not, no, I'm not one of them. Someone else asked him. He became a little more bold, and he said, no, no, I'm, what do you think? I'm not one of them. And this young girl said it again. I know that you're, you're one of those 12 disciples, those apostles. You've got a Galilean accent, and all of them are from Galilee. And then Peter began, each time he denied Christ, it got easier and easier. With swearing and cursing, he said, I'm telling you, I don't know the man. And you know, Christ warned him that was going to happen because Peter was always worried about what the crowd thought of him. And then he heard the rooster crow. And then he looked inside the judgment hall. And Jesus turned and looked at him. And then another fist of a guard pummeled Jesus in the face. And Christ, and says Peter went out and he wept bitterly. He ended up denying Christ because he followed him from too big a distance. Do your neighbors know you're a Christian? Do the people that you work with every day, do they have to say, oh, you're a Christian? <laughs> I'm not saying that you should go around preaching being obnoxious for Jesus all the time because you've got that other extreme. But we shouldn't hide our light under a bush, should we? Let people know. Don't be ashamed of Christ. Jesus said, whoever is ashamed of me in this wicked and adulterous generation, I'll be ashamed of him before my Father and the angels. But whoever confesses me in this wicked and adulterous generation, I will confess his name before my, before my Father and the angels of God. And that's exactly what God did with Job. You ever read that story? God Almighty confesses the name of Job to the devil and his minions. Have you considered my servant Job? He lives for me. His light is on a hill. You know, God needs more people like that. I think Wesley said, if you could just give me a hundred men that aren't afraid of anything but God, he says, I could change the world. We want to be the sheep that follow the good shepherd. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I want to be one of the 144,000, don't you? You know what it says about them? These are they that follow the lamb wherever he goes. And as I've said a thousand times, if you want to follow him there then, you must first follow him here now. It's not that you're going to get to heaven and say, suddenly I get to follow Jesus. You need to start the practice of following him and his word now.
if we're going to follow him then. Spurgeon said, we should follow our Lord as unhesitatingly as sheep follow their shepherd. For he has a right to lead us wherever he pleases. We are not our own. We are bought with a price. Let us recognize the rights of the redeeming blood. The soldier follows his captain. The servant obeys his master. Much more should we follow our redeemer for whom we are purchased. We are a purchased possession. Jesus has the right for us to follow him because he created us and then he bought us with his blood and he's recreated us why would we think things would ever go better following our will instead of his? Think about it. Logically, you know that can't be true. Your idea about your plan for your life can never be better than God's plan. But yet, how often we don't trust God enough to surrender and really follow him in the big things and in the little things. Jesus came to lead us. I heard about, uh, heard about a man in Syria who was visiting there one time and he saw all these shepherds, all these different shepherds, they converged with their little flocks of sheep on this one watering hole and they all visited with each other and they're all smoking cigarettes and talking together and, and then as it got time, the sheep were done being watered and the shepherds were scattering and going different directions. They gave out this call and I can't repeat it but in Arabic was something like mini, mini, mini and they would and the sheep would uh, they all separate even though they were all congealed together when the shepherds began to separate the sheep all began to separate and untangle themselves from each other and follow their shepherds and he thought this was amazing he said through his translator he says can I talk to one of the shepherds he said sure he ran down the water hill he said can I try that he said try what he said I'd like to call your sheep he said help yourself he went up on the hill and he said the same thing they said not a sheep budged he says they don't know your voice. They're not going to follow you. And he said, do they always follow their shepherd? He said, no, not always. He said, sometimes they're sick and then they'll follow anybody. You know, when we're spiritually sick as Christians, we'll listen to all kinds of voices. Friends, it is more important now than ever before that we become a people of the book, rightly dividing the word of truth. There are so many pardon me, crazy ideas out there in the Christian world and even in our church. All these different doctrines of devils that are dividing people. If there is ever a time for us to know the voice of the shepherd so we don't get confused, if you're willing to obey, you know the Bible promises if any man is willing to do his will, he will know of the doctrine whether it be of God and he'll follow. If you say, Lord, I'm willing to follow, I'm willing to obey, he'll reveal it to you. And you'll know. And then it's not just enough that we follow the word. We want to forward the word. It's not just about us being saved. When we are following Christ, we're going to want to tell other people about being saved. You know, the disciples said, where are we going to get enough bread for all these people to Jesus? Mark chapter 6. Jesus said, do you have anything? Oh, Lord, we've got a few crumbs. The boy's got a lunch here. He's got a couple of sardines and some loaves. He said, bring it to me. They brought their bread to Jesus. He took it, he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it back. And then they shared it with the people. So it's not just about our having bread. It's then sharing bread. Now at the end of that day, did the disciples get plenty to eat? They did. If those disciples had said, hey guys, gather around, we found a boy here with some lunch, let's keep it for ourselves, they wouldn't have had enough to eat. But when the disciples brought it to Jesus and he blessed it, suddenly it fed a great multitude. Can you say amen? So the main reason that we're studying the word is not just to save ourselves, but God wants to save other people through us. As we follow the word, then we want to forward the word by setting our light on a hill. Amen? I heard years ago about a man, and his wife was a Christian. He was not and he was always arguing with her every Christmas. They'd tell the Christmas story how God became a man. He thought, oh, that's such a, who can believe that? Why would God do that? And he was a farmer. And one winter night, and it was right around New Year's, after he had had a big argument with his wife during Christmas, a terrible blizzard came in. And it was one of those whiteout blizzards. And then they heard a thud 
on the house and then another thud on the house. There's something banging on the roof. And he tried to open the door and see what was going on. It was just blinding white. He couldn't see anything. Soon there was a lull in the storm. He stepped outside again and he saw what it was. There was a flock of geese that had gotten lost in this snowstorm and they were confused and they had no landmarks and they were hovering over a field that he had um, in the middle of the woods, one of his farm fields. And he felt so sorry for all the geese. It was bitterly cold and they hadn't gotten south far enough. They got caught in this blizzard and he thought, you know, I bet I could save every one of them. I just opened the barn, they'll go in the barn. So he went and he, he opened up the barn and none of the geese, the wild geese, went in the barn. He thought, maybe I need a light in the barn. So he put a light in the barn so they'd see it. And they were all squawking around. He said, no, it's not working. So he got some breadcrumbs and he, some breadcrumbs and some of them picked at the crumbs on the outer edge but they wouldn't go anywhere near his dwelling. These are wild geese. So he got out behind them. They couldn't fly because it was still snowing and he tried to shoo them into the barn and they just scattered and got more frightened and chaotic than ever. And he thought, well, there's no way I'm ever going to get them in the barn unless I was a goose. And then an idea came to him. He said, I've got a goose. He went in the barn. He got one of the geese out of the pen. He carried it under his arm. He went out behind the wild geese and he let his goose go and it flew right through all the wild geese back into the barn. And then one of the wild geese followed it and then another and then soon the whole flock went in. And the Lord spoke to him. He said, you couldn't save the geese because you weren't a goose. God could not save humanity without becoming a human. Jesus became one of us to save us. He lived among men and he showed us how to live. Jesus came for three reasons. Show us what the Father is like. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He came to show us how to live as our example. He says, I have given you an example that you should walk even as I have walked. What does it mean to follow Jesus? To be a Christian, to follow his example, to love the way he loved. How can we do that if he lives out his life in us? Paul said, it's not I that live, but Christ that lives in me. Amen? You can have that experience. That's, he would not say that unless it was possible for you to have that experience. And then the third reason Jesus came is to die as our substitute in our place, to take all of our sins away. And if he did that, if he poured out his blood, then it must be possible for us to be cleansed from all unrighteousness. He's making that available for only those of you who qualify. There's only a few here that qualify. Those of you who know you're sinners. It says he came into the world to save sinners. Paul said, and I'm the chief. I could argue with Paul about who would win that. But if he could do that for Paul, if he could do that for the thief on the cross, he can do it for you, friends. Why don't you ask him now? Let's pray together. Father, we're so thankful that you sent your son into the world to die for our sins as our example. Help us to have the courage to not only be hearers of the word, but to follow the word, to follow Jesus day by day in the new year spread before us. We thank you and we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you, friends. Thank you so much. You have a blessed new year, and we look forward to seeing you. Be praying about what's happening in the world. We're looking forward to the day where we can meet unencumbered in this place. Can you say amen? Pray for the country. Uh, pray for the, the people and your neighbors, and pray for the church that we might have a revival. Amen? God bless you, and you have a good week.